All right, so Patrick Henry. I had said about um, Samuel Adams that he was uh, the one who carried the burden uh, of the revolutionary movement more than any other single character. Uh, I'm gonna change the analogy a little bit and say that um, Samuel Adams was kind of the torchbearer. And if we can look see that analogy, I will say that Patrick Henry was the one who lit the torch. So you can kind of get that idea. Um, so Patrick Henry, um, this is gonna mess with me. <laughs> okay, the uh, bibliography. So I have three books here. Um, you can see that. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Um, the one at the top uh, was interesting in that it was a biography that was written back in um, 1888. Moses Coit Tyler, uh, eminent historian, and a very good history. Um, and for those of you who have read uh, books of the 1800s, you'll have an idea of the, uh, the language and the, uh, the prose that is used is a lot more uh, expanded, you might say, than the type of prose that we use uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and, you know, some people like that kind of thing. I, I can enjoy it at times, um, and some people really don't like it, but uh, it's a good biography. One of the interesting things, though, that I liked about it was that he mentions, he talks about things that um, kids in school all know about. Back in the eight, excuse me, back in the 1800s, of course, all students or most students have memorized Patrick Henry's great speech, right? <laughs> well, they did back in the 1800s. They also knew about some of his other great speeches that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, all you know, grade school kids would know these other great speeches that Henry was famous for that uh, nowadays most people just don't. Um, the next one is an updated one, just uh, came out last year, I think. Um, an excellent biography. I would highly recommend this one if you are interested in a good biography. Um, John Kukla, uh, 500 pages. And, and I had to laugh. Uh, this is kind of a side thing altogether, but uh, Kukla, doesn't that bring back memories? Does anybody? Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. Yeah, that's right. Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. I, I just laughed when I saw that name. and thought, wow, that brings back <laughs> memories. Uh, so, um, but this is an excellent, very well-written biography. The last one I, I put in there, I don't have it myself, but this was the first great biography of Patrick Henry by a guy, it came out in uh, 1817, by a guy who was extensively interviewing people who had known him. Uh, so this is, for a lot of historians, is kind of a primary resource, because he interviewed Thomas Jefferson and uh, John Adams and others to get uh, some firsthand accounts of Patrick Henry. Oh, and you can, I, I, did you give his dates, Patrick Henry's dates? Born, oh, I haven't done that yet. This is just the bibliography. I'm <laughs> he died in, in uh, 1799. Can we have his name in the title? <clears throat> so this is William Wirt, W-I-R-T. And uh, yeah, it came out in 1817. Um, very extensive. If you, if you really want to know about Patrick Henry, this is um, kind of the original first great biography of him. It's not perfect, and historians have found some uh, errors in it since then, but it's still, a, it's, it's the foundational biography for Patrick Henry. And so we go on. So, born May 29th, uh, 1736, came from a well-to-do uh, family. He lived in a 3,000 square foot home, which was enormous for the time. 
The typical family would be would live in a house that's more like 400 square feet. So his, his father, John Henry, had a master's of arts that uh, he got in Scotland. He was born and raised in Scotland, Aberdeen, and uh, he immigrated to America. He became a surveyor and eventually he became, oh, one of the things too, he became a word that I've heard many times but never knew the meaning of until I looked it up, a vestryman. Mm. How many of you know what a vestryman is? Mm. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, it's basically the, uh, in the church, the church vestryman uh, would be taking care of the church. He, you know, it's different from a deacon. Uh, the vestryman takes care of kind of the business end of the, uh, the board church. Of mm. Yeah, the board of directors, things like that. Very good. Mm. Um, and he was also a justice of the peace. He became a judge, and that was his career also. And as most people of the time did, if you had any money, you invested it in land. And that, he was very involved with that as well. Um, he got his social standing, though, from his wife, whom he married in America. His wife was, came from a well-to-do family, and they got their social standing uh, from her, mostly. Um, as a child, uh, Patrick Henry, Henry grew up. He was not a great scholar as a kid. He loved to play. He became uh, very good at... Uh, what was it, the violin and the flute. So he was very much into dancing. He loved to, to uh, go to parties, and he was kind of the life of the party. Mm. He was very social kind of guy. Everybody liked him, very nice, and he loved to have a good time. Um, when he did start getting into uh, reading, uh, it was more, uh, he would take a book and he would read it very, very thoroughly and before he was finally finished with it. He did not read widely, but he was very thorough in the books that he read. All right. Um, as he got older, as a teen, um, yeah, okay. So he was, he was known to be a very friendly guy. He was very observant, curious, and he was very religious, as many people were. But uh, yeah, he was noted for being a devoted church member, uh, but as a scholar, somewhat mediocre. Uh, he got married at a fairly young age, and we, sometimes there's a misconception, and nowadays we see, uh, we think that people back in those days, well, everybody got married really early. But that's not the case, especially for men. Men generally, if you were heading anywhere in life, uh, you established yourself and uh, didn't get married till mid to late 20s. He got married at 18, and he was not ready for it. And his uh, wife, uh, Sarah, was only 16. That would be more typical of, of women to get married that young, but not for men. But uh, fortunately for uh, Patrick, he was marrying into a fairly well-to-do family, so he was given some very nice gifts, both from his parents and from her parents, of land and slaves. So, so he was somewhat established uh, when he got married, and, um, but promptly lost a lot of it uh, in the downturn, the, the, the economies sometimes would be up, sometimes down, and they got together in a rather down time. They started a, a, a small country store, which didn't do too well. So they would buy some land, got a farm, tried to work their slaves on the farm, and uh, prices were somewhat depressed on the crops, so that didn't work out too well. They went back into uh, creating a store, and that wasn't going well. And so, finally, Henry decided that he was going to be, oh wait, before I do that, here's the, the Sheldon house. This is uh, her parents' house that they got married in, it's still there today. Um, Where is 
shell, it's in, in Virginia somewhere, I'm not sure, I, honestly. But uh, you could probably look up the Sheldon House, there's probably a plaque out front and you can go and visit it. So, his store did not succeed too well. He decided to get into the law as a profession. And um, so he studied. There's a lot of uh, disagreement. We're not really sure how long he studied because there's like four or five different accounts of him telling people or other people saying he only studied this long or he only studied that long. Um, so the, the, the range is anywhere from between one month to six months, which still isn't a lot of time if you're gonna study to be a lawyer. Um, but he studied for a few months, and then uh, in order to become a lawyer, he had to be interviewed by four prominent attorneys, and um, he barely uh, passed. There's, again, there's various recollections as to the response from these attorneys uh, when they met him and talked with him, but the general idea is he was rather ignorant of the law, but he had a very sharp mind, and they recognized that. And he begged and pl promised that he was going to study more. So I promise I will study, I will study, uh, if only you just pass me. And they finally said, okay, okay, we'll, we'll pass you. Because uh, one guy in particular who was interviewed said that they talked for several hours about the law and history and uh, you know what he knows and what he doesn't know. and. Uh, so this guy was very impressed by his wit, by his intelligence. He was really sharp. What he did know, he could uh, elaborate on and he could uh, talk about concepts very clearly and he could make arguments very clearly. So the guy said, well, you have a good mind. If you study more, you could be a good lawyer. So he said, I promise, I promise. Okay. Yes, he did. Yes, as a matter of fact, at, at this point, he is becoming a more responsible uh, person. And once he did become a lawyer, he became a very popular one uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so he, he got his what do you call that? He became a lawyer, um, <laughs> succeeded to the bar, whatever, only it's not the bar back in those days, I don't think. Uh, but anyway, he became a lawyer in 1760, and rather quickly, he became fairly popular, and he was doing fairly well, well for himself. Okay. And um, what else we got? Oh yeah. So one of the things, one of the things that um, it was noted that by 1763 uh, he was doing well enough so that he could actually loan money to both his father and his father-in-law, uh, who were having some financial difficulties. And he was known as a guy who could sway juries. One of the things that he was really good at, not just his intellect and his arguments, but uh, he could put a lot of emotion into it. And, um, and as we know, sometimes that's what is needed to sway the jury. And his first really big case that made him famous, truly famous, was the Parsons cause. Now I, I've mentioned that um, he was a very religious person, very devoted to the church, uh, very uh, prominent as a Christian. Uh, Christian virtues were very important to him. But in the Parsons cause, he was fighting against the church, against the Parsons. So what this was, in uh, 1755 and 1758, uh, separately there were laws passed, they were temporary laws. Back in those days, the Parsons were paid in tobacco. They were supposed to be paid 16,000 pounds 
per year. Now, that's all well and good if the price of tobacco stays stable. It does not go well when the price fluctuates wildly, and it does. Sometimes the price skyrockets, and then the people who are paying the Parsons are out a lot more money. And that's what happened, 1755 and 1758, the price had skyrocketed. And so the uh, planters go to the legislature and say, wait, this isn't right. We're now paying these Parsons, if, this, if we have to do this, we're paying them more than twice what they normally get. Now you two don't, don't start messing around back there. I'll have to send you the principal's office. They're playing with paper airplanes in the back there. <laughs> I've taught junior hires before. I know how to handle them. <laughs> so I wasn't expecting that. Um, so now where was I? I <laughs> so, so they go to the legislature and they say, um, what we need to do we need you to pass a bill, it'll be temporary, 10 months, 12 months, they will be paid uh, in uh, cash. The, we have money, we can just give them cash. And so it was to be uh, at two pence, or two pennies per pound of tobacco, and that's how we are going to rate that. And the Parsons weren't very happy about it, but, um, there were enough, there's enough pressure on the legislature, so it passed both times. Um, as it turns out, it was a very bad deal for the Parsons because the money, of course, is terribly depreciated and is not worth what it's supposed to be worth. And not only that, but it's only uh, good in the colonies, not with Great Britain. So uh, the Parsons were up in arms and they said, you know, it was illegal for you to do this anyway. This is something that should be passed or at least okayed by the king, and you didn't do that. Mm. And, and they kind of knew it. They weren't supposed to do this. Mm. But since uh, the king is in England and they are in Virginia, mm. and it, the communication takes such a long time, uh, round trip, and it's only temporary, mm. they felt, well, we can get away with this, and they did. So the Parsons, uh, the second time around, they send somebody to Great Britain and say, look, this is what they're doing. They need to uh, pay us back uh, what we have lost for those months. And so the king um, said, you're right. I'm going to nullify this law. And he did. What he didn't say is that the Parsons deserve their back pay. He didn't make a decision on that. So they come back and the Parsons take it to court. The king has nullified this law, so we are owed back pay. And so the court made the decision, yes, um, you're right, so you are deserved the back pay. So they felt they had won. It was something they were very happy about. Yeah, okay. So they were due the back pay, but they needed another court date with a jury to decide how much they were going to get in their back pay. It should have been uh, pretty cut and dry, very simple, um, until the planters hired Patrick Henry to defend their side. And so Patrick Henry came out and he did some very radical things. He stood, he, he harangued the jury for about an hour or so about how unjust this is. Not only is the king a tyrant for annulling this perfectly good law, but the clergy uh, are a bunch of avaricious, vicious enemies of the people for wanting this back pay. And I have a quote. Now, one of the, one of the sad things about um, what we know of Patrick Henry's great speeches is uh, we don't have them verbatim. We have notes from various people uh, who had written some, some of their ideas down, but we don't have any, any of his speeches complete, except recreations of them. So here's 
what he said about the clergyman. Litigious clergymen ought to be considered as enemies of the community. Do they manifest their zeal by practicing the mild and benevolent precepts of the gospel of Jesus? Do they feed the hungry and clothe the naked? Oh no, gentlemen, these rapacious harpies would, were their power equal to their will, snatch from the hearth of their poorest parishioner his last hoe cake, from the widow and her orphan children their last milch cow, and the last, and the last bed, nay, the last blanket from the lying-in woman. <laughs> so that's against the Parsons. And he said about the king, resist the dictatorial intervention by the crown, lest you rivet the chains of bondage on your own necks. If you must find for the plaintiff, you need not find more than one farthing. And they did. The jury was so moved in. By the way, what I hadn't mentioned, uh, Patrick Henry was instrumental in choosing the jury, and he made sure he got a good one. He did not choose anybody from uh, the gentry or the arist not aristocracy, but the upper classes. He got the commoners in this jury, and uh, they were all excited about this. And so, oh. One other good thing about this, as he was going on and on about the king, and he said the king forfeits uh, all his, his rights to his subject's obedience. And some people were in the crowd were saying that's treason. And so they're looking at each other, and they look up at the judge, and he's not doing anything. He said the judge should be saying, wait a second, you're out of line. The judge was Henry's father. Oh. <laughs> so he was okay with it. <laughs> So, so the, uh, the jury came back and said, we award the parts, and this was just one, the first case among many that were going to be held, each parson individually, and we award the parson one penny in damages. <laughs> that was it. And uh, at the end of this, uh, Henry is carried out of the courtroom on the shoulders of the triumphant ordinary people. Yeah, you think nowadays, like, uh, that would be not okay. Okay. Yeah, so the jury deliberated five minutes, came back with one penny. So, yeah. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> it seems that the Parsons were state employees. Yeah. Uh, so when the, the Constitution was written, state and the religion were divorced from each other. Right. And that was, that was very important. And, and by the way, Patrick Henry, a little later on, one of his um, precepts that he had come across and <coughs> developed personally was that, um, uh, and he, well, he had friends in many denominations. One of the more hated denominations at the time were the Baptists. And uh, there were certain Baptist preachers who were being arrested for preaching without a license. And so he stood up for them uh, very strongly. He said the year was 1755, 1758. There was no state. Uh, well, I mean the crown. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they were government employees. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And here's the uh, courthouse that that dramatic event took place in. And then we come to the Stamp Act. And what something that, that kind of occurred to me, the more I read uh, these different biographies, is how many of these ideas uh, were already out there for the more intellectual uh, people of the time. Things like taxation without representation, the king may be a tyrant. These ideas were out there for people who are uh, educated and uh, reading up on the latest philosophies of the day. So there, in 1764, news was coming across the Atlantic that um, 
the, uh, the Prime Minister was planning on imposing a tax. Already, they were going to, there was the Sugar Act, which actually lowered the duty on sugar, but enforced it, uh, that they were not happy about. But also, with that news was, we are going to impose a stamp tax in order to raise money for the uh, soldiers that are uh, stationed in America. So, Patrick Henry is upset about this, as many are, and he's going to prepare himself for this. And he starts reading up. He has read a lot about John Locke, which is, like many, he used John Locke in his arguments in the Parsons case, that yes, kings can be tyrants, which basically means they're not necessarily chosen by God, and they can be overthrown. So this time, he's going to prepare himself by reading someone who is a precursor to John Locke. Any really educated people who want to take a shot at who that might be? No, not Rousseau. This, the name just really gets me. Uh, Samuel Puffendorf. <laughs> How many of you ever heard of Samuel Puffendorf? No? <laughs> Foundational stuff, you gotta get some Puffendorf. <laughs> so he, re he wrote a very influential book, um, The Law of Nature and Nations, back in 1667, which was prior to John Locke. John Locke got a lot of his ideas from Puffendorf. Uh, ideas like men are born into nature. There is a state of nature in which no uh, government exists and people have to create it from scratch. And uh, so what do you do when you have no government and you have to create it? That's kind of the ideas that were uh, being circulated at the time. <coughs> and that if people are in a state of nature and they are creating a government, they, what they're doing in effect is creating a social contract. There's another big term that people, uh, that was influential throughout the Western world. The state of nature, the social contract. And he spent a lot of time in this, in this work, Puffendorf, about uh, the, the rights of the accused and how it's important that it's someone who is accused of a crime have a lawyer to defend them. This is kind of new stuff, that it should be a right, not just if they can afford it, but it sh everyone should have uh, someone to defend them in court. And even if they were guilty, and you know they were guilty, and it's obviously obvious that they are guilty, they should still have a defense. So, and in case you wanted to see Puffendorf, that's what he looked like. Yeah, he was, he was from Germany, a German guy. So, the Stamp Act, he prepared himself very thoroughly, and um, he was going to, he drew up resolutions. He, he became a member of the House of Burgesses, Henry did, and, um, and this was uh, really just within weeks of him being elected that he becomes one of the major voices, sometimes the major voice, of the House of Burgesses. And so he immediately presents seven resolutions that he wants voted on about the Stamp Act. Um, so the first four are fairly generalized about how American colonists have the same rights as native born uh, people of Great Britain. When they came over, they did not lose their rights. We have the same rights, and, and our descendants have the same rights as native-born Englishmen. And the charters of each of the colonies uh, are, in, are 
the force of law. They should have the force of law just like any law in England. And with that, any taxation imposed has to be from our own assemblies. The taxation from Great Britain in the Parliament is invalid. They do not have the power to do that. And then the kicker, the seventh one, was basically anyone who disagrees with this, we are going to consider an enemy of the people. <laughs> so the resolutions were um, argued over. The first four passed fairly easily. Uh, the fifth one that said uh, taxation from Great Britain is not valid, uh, barely passed. The sixth and seventh were a little too hot and they were not going to pass those. However, once the, all this argument, oh, and I need to tell you, what's, this was one of his first great speeches also. Um, this is where he's arguing in front of them and he says, uh, Caesar had his Brutus. Charles II, his Cromwell, and George III, and at that point, people start yelling, treason, treason. <laughs> and um, now there's, again, we don't have, nobody was taking minutes, nobody was recording, so there's some debate as to what exactly happened at that point. Um, but uh, the, uh, the more exciting version says that, um, that George III may profit from their example. Somebody's still shouting treason, and he says, if this be treason, make the most of it. That probably was not said. It sounds really good, but um, I think it, one of the things, Thomas Jefferson uh, had a version of this, and Thomas Jefferson, being a great uh, writer himself, uh, sometimes made it a lot nicer than it really was. Um, Another version uh, just says that when they start shouting treason, he said, uh, if I have offended anybody, uh, I, I apologize. I, have, I still am loyal to the king, and on and on. So it's kind of a half-hearted apology, but he, he did apologize. So the resolutions, the first five are passed. Um, at the next day, once Henry had gone home, but they were still in session. A lot of people had gone home. Uh, they rescinded, they took off the fifth one because they didn't like that one. And uh, so they were going to just have the first four as resolutions. However, somebody got a hold of all seven and published them. This is the point that the idea of uh, British tyranny, the tyranny of parliament, um, and that we have our rights that we really need to stand up for circulated throughout the colonies. All of the colonies had their own particular resolutions. Uh, Massachusetts, of course, was fairly strong in their resolutions, but when they saw the seven coming out from Virginia, they were astonished and they thought, wow, these guys are really uh, hardcore in this and they thought, we like that, and we're going to adopt more stringent uh, resolutions as well. And that was the fire that I mentioned, that Patrick Henry lit. It was not just, see a lot of the colony, colonies would pass resolutions saying, this is a hardship for us. You really shouldn't have such, uh, try to raise so much money for us, it's a hardship please do something, lower the taxes, uh, and uh, you know, we're still your loyal subjects, please just do something to relieve the, uh, the amount. What was so different, of course, Patrick Henry said, no, you don't have the right. And anybody who thinks they, that you do is our enemy. Very strong statement. So, Here's one of the uh, <laughs> paintings of this. Um, very soon after, uh, as we know, the stamp tax passed, came to uh, the colonies, 
course, they couldn't do anything because in virtually every colony, they forced the uh, tax distributor to resign their positions, and they did that in Virginia as well. Uh, the guy uh, was in Great Britain and really didn't know what was going on as he was sailing to uh, Virginia. And people were getting really worked up about what we're going to do to this guy when he gets here. And they were having, uh, they had their own uh, Stamp Act riots, not nearly as severe as in Boston. Oh, one other thing. King George III's birthday was, was it June, June 4th. Nobody shows up, or almost nobody shows up. And this was from a guy who was, who was traveling through the colonies at the time, and he noted that people were getting really worked up about the stamp tax and that the king was becoming very unpopular. And so on the king's birthday, he shows up to see what was going on. It's like almost nobody showed up. Something that traditionally uh, people would throw great parties for and have great celebrations. We're celebrating the, the king's birthday, long live the king, and they have a great time. Uh, this time, uh, nobody wanted to celebrate. So, yeah, and also at that time, the governor, uh, and here's another French word, uh, Farquier, Fauquier, he's on there. Somebody help me with this one. Who's our French guy? Fauquier. How do you pronounce that? Fauquier, Governor Fauquier, he's on your uh, handout. Uh-oh. And see, that's what happens when you mess around in class. How does it say? Fauquier? Okay. I'm going to talk to your parents about this. <laughs> and there he is, Governor Fauquier. Um, okay. So the riots, and I put them in quotation marks in Virginia, were fairly tame compared to Boston standards. Uh, it was, they were basically orchestrated parades through town that had the uh, stamp officer, George Mercer, on uh, in effigy. They parade him through town, and they do terrible things to him, whip him, beat him, and, and uh, oh, they had him mounted on a horse backwards. They paraded him through town, and uh, they caned him, they whipped him, and at the end of it, they had a great bonfire and burned him up. That was the first one. There was a second one, too. Uh, Richard Henry Lee, who became a very prominent uh, patriot as well, he organized one and um, kind of the same thing, paraded him through town. And uh, Richard Henry Lee uh, made a speech that was uh, George Mercer's dying speech in which George Mercer lamented his sins, that he loved gold too much and that he was a slave to riches. And uh, so he deserves the just punishment of the people. And, uh, and then he was burned up. So here's kind of a uh, picture of somebody who's in effigy being paraded through town. <laughs> And of course, as we know, the Stamp Act was a complete failure because there's no stamps to distribute. You can't uh, bring anybody into court for not having the stamps because you can't have a court without the stamps. So it completely failed. And one of the things that uh, the, uh, the British military at the time was, was telling the Crown, we cannot be everywhere in the colonies. This is not just Boston. This is everywhere, and we can't 
uh, invade every single town to force them to take these stamps. We don't have nearly enough soldiers. Um, so I'm, just to stop, pause a moment to talk about uh, Patrick Henry as a man of character. And this is from the, the, uh, the biography that I had that was very good, the middle one of the group, um, Kukla, John Kukla, can't forget that name. Um, he was, as I said earlier, he was seen as a very friendly, affable sort of guy. Everybody liked him for the most part, except when you get into politics. Um, but he had slaves. And so one of the things that he goes in, in depth in this biography is about Patrick Henry's view of slavery. He felt terrible about it, kind of like uh, Thomas Jefferson. He didn't like the idea at all. But um, he knew that he couldn't get along without him. If you have a plantation, if you have a farm of any size, um, you just can't, do, can't work it without slaves. And so he made statements throughout his life how much he dislikes the idea of slavery, but he stuck with it, and he, he was a slave owner, and he worked his slaves. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, his religious toleration of Baptist. He defended uh, Baptists in court, saying that, um, you know, why are you arresting these men for preaching the gospel? That seems very wrong. Uh, so he and and throughout his life, uh, Baptists knew they could count on him to defend them. He was a good friend to them, and also uh, he was he was a very devoted husband and father, uh, by all accounts. Uh, he loved his wife, he loved his kids, and cared for them very much. Um, and we'll in a little bit we'll talk about how he took care of his first wife as she was dying. Then we come to the townshend duties. Remember we talked about how one of the arguments against the Stamp Act was that it was an internal tax. And some people were saying, and Ben Franklin in England was saying, we don't like internal taxes, but we will accept external taxes because they've been around forever. The duties on imports, we will accept that. So they said, fine, we will now raise uh, money with these duties on various items. So now Virginia has a new governor. Here's another difficult, not French, but it's kind of a difficult boat to tort. I think that's how it's done. Um, and um, at first, uh, this new governor was pretty much uh, thinking he was just going to leave the colonists alone and uh, they'll come around to their senses soon enough. I'm not going to bother them. Uh, he was known, he had a reputation as a whore master. This was the three things that he was known for. Uh, a whore master, a drunkard, and a, a gambler. <laughs> and as it turns out, uh, that was terribly unjust because he was only a whore master and a gambler, <laughs> or a whore, a whore master, and a, what was the other one? African. Drunkard. drunkard, that's right, thank and you. <laughs> and a drunkard. So he was just a, a whore master and a drunkard, he was not a gambler. <laughs> and here's a boat to tort. Uh, he was actually the governor of New York, and uh, since uh, the first one, Farquhar, passed away, the king decided he needed somebody who had experience, and so he uh, appointed the governor of New York to move down to Virginia. And of course, as, as I've said before and will say over and over again, uh, the non-importation agreements uh, did the trick both with the Stamp Act and with the Townshend duties. If nobody's gonna buy anything from Great Britain, they don't work. You can't raise money when nobody's gonna buy anything. So all of the colonies drew up these non-importation agreements. We are not going to buy anything from Great Britain. And, um, and the interesting thing in Virginia, they drew up this 
uh, resolution, we will not buy from Great Britain. All of the uh, Burgesses sign it, and they post it out in public places so that common people can sign it too. And virtually everybody who was a freeholder, had land and money, came and signed this. We will not buy anything from Great Britain, or at least the listed things. And um, so the town Shen duties were repealed. So, unfortunately for uh, Governor Botetort, uh, he lasted two years and he died as well. So we got a new governor. Uh, you know what, I gotta make a retraction here. It's the, it's the new one who is the whoremaster and the drunkard, not Botetort. My apologies to Botetort. Uh, is Governor John Murray, uh, Earl of Dunmore, who is the one who is appointed next, and uh, he was had the reputation of the whoremaster, drunkard, and gambler. And, uh, and uh, for two years, this is the period of calm. 1770 to 1772, things were fairly calm, and uh, he had a, a, a good time of it for that period of time. And here's Dunmore, and look how he's dressed. Scottish. But it was not to last. In uh, 1772, uh, there was an incident in Rhode Island, the Gaspy incident, where um, people of, of Rhode Island see this schooner out there, and it's a customs schooner out searching for uh, people who are smuggling, and it hit some rocks and was stranded, and so a number of colonists rode out there and uh, took control of it, uh, kicked all the uh, customs officers off of there and burned it to the water line. Um, Virginians, as many colonists, they, they knew that they couldn't say, yeah, we're, we're totally in favor of burning schooners to the water line. Uh, but they tried to skirt the issue a bit and said, yeah, we wouldn't agree with doing that. But you know, if the king wasn't such a tyrant, these things wouldn't happen. Um, but in the meantime, the committees of correspondence were being uh, fully developed uh, between the various colonies. And this was primarily pushed both by Massachusetts and Virginia. And at this time, kind of in his personal life, Henry was telling people that um, the tensions are growing, war is going to come. Whether we like it or not, uh, this is where we're heading. And so there was the Tea Party in Boston, 1773, and the Port Bill. How are we all going to respond as fellow uh, colonists to uh, Boston's port being shut down. Well, we're going to support them. Something the king was hoping to do, and parliament was hoping to do, was to divide and conquer. If we could just have uh, the stronger colonies uh, be separate from the others, uh, we, can, we can settle this thing. We can get them uh, where we want them. But they weren't going to. The colonies, colonists united, and they supported. They sent supplies to Boston. And Virginia was uh, one of the main helpers in this matter. Um, Dunmore, uh, with the new resolutions coming out of Virginia in support of Boston, uh, he dissolves the assembly. And so at this time, uh, the, assembly, the Burgesses are going to uh, meet down the road. Where if they can't, if they can't, meet legally, they will meet illegally, and they did. And so they selected delegates to go to the first Continental Congress, and Virginia, at this time, they knew that they had some great leaders. They knew that they had some of the most prominent intellectuals, 
and great leaders that they were going to send to this uh, First Continental Congress. And they expected, when they sent George Washington there, that if there was an army to lead, he was going to lead it. When they sent Peyton Randolph, who was also a great leader, they expected him to lead the Congress. They sent Patrick Henry and Richard Henry Lee, who both were known as great orators. They were going to be the great speakers of this First Continental Congress. Now here's another one that, um, see if anybody recognizes. Patrick Henry and Richard Henry Lee were the great speakers of the day. Richard Henry Lee was known as the Cicero of the day. <laughs> Patrick Henry was known as Demoth Demosthenes. What is the difference between Cicero and Demosthenes? And I don't know if they just made this up or what, but apparently it meant something to them. So when Cicero speaks, the people listen, they say, wow, Cicero is a great speaker. When Demosthenes speaks, they say, march, we go to war. <laughs> and that was Patrick Henry. And so there were seven delegates. I put in pictures of four of them, the most prominent. So Peyton Randolph, there's George Washington, uh, Richard Henry Lee, and Patrick Henry. This would have been so good if I had this screen up here. <laughs> so when Patrick Henry shows up and all the delegates are there, uh, Patrick Henry was never known as someone who dressed very well. He came across as a poor uh, parson out in the country and of course, nobody knows what anybody looks like back in those days. So when he shows up and he's about to speak before the Congress, um, it was said some of the members are looking at him and they kind of wince and they think this poor country bumpkin is going to speak before this august group of men and he's going to try to impress us. And uh, we feel bad for him because he's going to look awful doing this until he started speaking, of course and he just electrified the Congress. They were stunned. Oh, that's Patrick Henry. Now we know. That was, he's just an amazing uh, speaker. And one of the things that he mentioned at the Congress, he was telling everybody, because we have been uh, occupied, the government is dissolved. We are in a state of nature. And everybody knew what that meant when he said that. And finally, I am not a Virginian. I am an American. We are all united here. So he made a very deep impression at the time. And of course, the First Continental Congress, um, basically are, they're promoting, again, non-importation, um, continued correspondence throughout the colonies, another petition to the king, and, uh, and so Patrick Henry, Henry wrote a letter uh, to the king himself, only it was an open letter that he was having published in uh, the local papers. It was, uh, he entitled it Scipio Letter. And, uh, and then of course they were to meet, Congress was to meet May 10th, 1775. And here's, I have a little excerpt from this Scipio letter to the king, an open letter. Good sir, awake from your lethargy and recede from the measures you have taken. Your brave subjects profess a decent and loyal obedience as subjects, but they dare tell you they will never become your slaves. The sword, great sire, is a dreadful umpire. So very bold talk from Patrick Henry. Also about this time, uh, he suffers a personal tragedy. His wife, after having their sixth child, uh, had developed the postpartum depression, a very severe form of it, and she went insane. This was 1771, is when she had this child, 
And so for the next four years, uh, Patrick Henry kept her in the basement of his house. Now, this basement did have windows, so it's not like it was like a dungeon or anything. He tried to keep her as, as well as could be kept at that time. He had a servant uh, feed her and take care of her, but she was locked up. Uh, when this first happened, um, they used what was called a straight dress. Instead of a straight jacket, they had a straight dress, and they wrapped her up in it. Uh, he had the chance to take her to a local hospital for the insane, which had just opened, um, and he, we believe, he toured it. And he went inside and he looked at this hospital, and they had cells like a prison, and they had chains against the wall in order to chain them up. That is how they treated the insane. He was not going to do that to his wife. He kept her in the basement, a well-lit basement. He kept her warm, dry, uh, but he kept her there. And uh, it was said that he visited her when he was home. He visited her several times a day to while, while she was lucid, and um, he cared for her. She died um, right before his, his great speech that we'll get to in 1775, just weeks before his great speech. So this is the home that he kept her in the basement. And you'll notice there are windows. Yeah, I think I have that there too. There are windows uh, to the basement, so that it was well lit. Quite a nice home for the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was not hurting for finances. He was not a Samuel Adams who was poor all his life. He was an attorney, and he made good money. Mm. Once, especially after the Parsons case when he uh, uh, won that, and he, he became a great celebrity locally, and he, uh, he was very called upon as a lawyer. This is the hospital that he could have taken her to brick building. Doesn't look so bad on the outside, but uh, apparently the cells on the inside were pretty uh, gruesome. <laughs> and so uh, the governor decides at this point that they are in rebellion. He's going to do what the crown did to Boston. He's going to shut down the ports in Virginia uh, and I'm not sure how effective that could be uh, with the limited power that he had. And Virginia has so many uh, rivers uh, and open ways to the ocean. Uh, I, I doubt that uh, he could have been very effective shutting down any port. Uh, but one of the things, this guy who at first wanted to leave the colonists to their own devices and they'll come around to their senses, decides that, no, this is, this is serious now and I'm going to crack down on these colonists. <laughs> one, of the, one of the quotes that we have from him at this time is that the Virginians will prostrate, prostrate themselves before the power they so lately treated with contempt. And that didn't work out well at either. <laughs> um, another kind of funny incident, the king drew up a list of prominent colonists that he, was, uh, that he sent secretly to uh, the colonies, to the governors, saying, these are the men I want you to round up and arrest. Of course, it didn't remain a secret long. It got out, and Patrick Henry was outraged. Why am I not on this list? <laughs> and very disappointed. So, the... Uh, the great speech. This was in uh, Richmond, which is, I think, something like 50 miles up from Williamsburg, which was the capital at the time. They were meeting together to uh, get delegates for the Second Continental Congress. And um, there were 119 members that met in Richmond. And um, Henry put, uh, for, uh, put forward a resolution that they need to be uh, put on a, uh, a posture of defense. 
They were going to raise an army. They were going to do, like in Massachusetts, they wanted to start stockpiling weapons, raise the army, start training them. That was his resolution at the time. And um, there were a lot of uh, men at, in the assembly that decided, no, that's, that's too far. We're not going to war with the king. We're just opposing his uh, acts. We're standing up for ourselves, but we're not going to raise an army. And so this is his great uh, time for speech. And um, so here's the famous, and I have this on your handout too, the, the famous painting of Patrick Henry giving this speech. Hmm. And, um, you know, worst of all, I had a video of a guy doing this speech. I went on YouTube looking for, because lots of people do this, right? We have a speech that was recreated, uh, and this was uh, William Wirt's work, actually. We think he kind of probably wrote it, because we have notes of a few people who said this is the kind of thing he was saying. Mm -hmm. And so, Somebody recreated it, put together, and so now we have this speech, beautiful speech, it's like seven minutes long or so. And, um, and there was a, a short movie done, I think it was back in the 50s, it's only 20 minutes long, but at the end of it is this great speech. And um, so I, I went on YouTube and I looked, there's many YouTube videos of men giving this speech. Most of them are pretty lousy. <laughs> Somebody gets together for a holiday or something, celebrate this, and, and at this church that it happened at, I think they do this every year on the date. Um, and so they hire actors to come uh, to portray the, the men in the assembly and Patrick Henry giving this great speech. And you go on YouTube and you see this, and you think, yeah, they didn't hire somebody who's really good at this. <laughs> but uh, this movie that I told you about, um, was made back, I think, in the 50s, and um, this short 20 minutes, and this guy, this actor, is very good. He gave a great speech, and I really wanted to present that. Uh, I wonder if we have sound. Yeah. Can you tell us where to find it? Let's see if I can, if, we don't have that, maybe we... Oh, we do have sound. Oh, come on. The chair recognizes Mr. Patrick Henry, delegate from County Hanover. Now, different men often see the same subject in different light. And therefore, I hope I will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do, opinions of a character opposite to theirs, I speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the House Starts is one of all slow moments he gets this country. Up. For my part, I consider it as a freedom or slavery and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. They throw in a couple of things that are just totally off historically. They even have his wife, who just recently died. I have died. one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British Ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which the gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the House. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has lately been received? Trust if not, sir, it will prove a snare to your feet. He acts as though he was afraid to speak out. 
Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed by a kiss. Your Excellency, I've just come from the church. See, this Patrick Henry is right. making a speech in the church. Well, I see no reason for further delay. You have your orders to arrest him. <laughs> yes, Your Excellency. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with the warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back love? And there's his dead wife. <laughs> <laughs> Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjection, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask the gentleman, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into subjection? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us, and they can be meant for no other. They were sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry had been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up to every light of which it is capable. But it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? And what terms shall we find which have not already been exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. We have done everything that could be done to avert the storm that is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, and we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been silent. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. And we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the court. In vain after these things may we indulge the vain hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve in violence those inestimable privileges for which we have so long been contending, if we mean not to basely abandon that noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest has been obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when will we be strong? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard is stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we learn the means of effectual resistance by lying so blindly on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope. Sir, we are not weak if we make use of those means which the God of nature has placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess is invincible to any force our army can send against us. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations who will raise up our friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the brave alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. 
The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of change and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death! if he spoke from notes or just so they the uh, this speech did change a couple of votes not a lot mm. so his resolution did pass mm. so anyway um that was really the bulk of the uh what his influence in the revolutionary movement once the revolution started he was pretty much a local man he became the governor the first governor of Virginia in the new country. Um, and as years passed, we know when the Constitution was uh, being proposed, the Constitutional Convention, uh, he was offered, they, they wanted him to come to the Constitutional Convention. He did not want to come. His remark was basically, I smell a rat. <laughs> and uh, for his opinions, um, he was correct. They were going to change the Articles of Confederation and create a whole new document, and of course they did. He didn't like it at all. He fought against it. Again, just like Samuel Adams, um, it was too powerful. He knew that Virginia was going to lose some of its sovereignty because of the Constitution, and so he fought against it. And unlike Samuel Adams, he fought against it to the end. He was not going to endorse it. Uh, of course, it passed anyway. Um, but as years went by, he pretty much reconciled himself uh, to the Constitution. He became governor again. He was first governor for three years, 76 to 79, and then in the 80s, he became governor. And then through the 90s, 1790s, he be went back to his practice as a lawyer and um, finished out his years uh, as a lawyer several times. He was still good friends with Washington uh, through all this time, despite the fact that Washington supported the uh, Constitution. But he was still good friends with Washington. Washington several times offered him positions. He wanted to, him to be on the Supreme Court, and uh, Patrick Henry said no. Uh, others offered him other positions. John Adams, when he became president, offered him an ambassadorship, uh, and he didn't want that. Um, as uh, he was nearing the end, uh, he was going to run for the assembly. And uh, in 1799, he became ill. He had some stomach problems, and he became completely blocked. His intestines were blocked. Mm. And so the doctor came to him and said, I have a remedy. It's either going to uh, cure you very quickly, or it's going to kill you very quickly. <laughs> so what do you choose? You are going to die anyway, within the next few days probably. So uh, that remedy was mercury. Oh. The blockage, because mer mercury is so heavy, uh, they, the idea goes, and this apparently works sometimes, you take a big dose of mercury and it unblocks, it's so heavy that it pushes through your intestines, and you are cured from this blockage. If it doesn't get through, you die very quickly. It didn't get through mm. for him, and he died. Mm. So that was the end of Patrick Henry. Mm. I'm so, sorry, I, I went way over again. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, you said something about first wife, so did he marry? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, he married again uh, in 77. His first wife, they had six kids. His second wife, they had 11 kids. <laughs> At his death, um, what was it? See, only eight of them were still alive. Hmm. Which, yeah, that's about par. What, the one unusual thing about that is that only one of them died in infancy. 
The others who died, um, died like in their late teens or early 20s, hmm. uh, the ones who died before him. Hmm. But he had a number of them that lived, you know, 60s and 70s, too. Hmm. So, yes? Another second question. Uh, now, why was it that, what was so wrong with the Baptists that they didn't, that whoever it was didn't lie? Oh, <laughs> Baptists have this terrible practice of baptizing adults <laughs> in immersion. Yeah. Okay. Who do we have? Do we have the Anglicans in Virginia? It's infant baptism with sprinkling. Well, I know that, but I just didn't know. Okay. Yeah, that was the main crux of it. So it, it was it was uh, theological. Oh yeah, it yeah. It wasn't that they were rabble rousing or. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they may have been rabble rousing, but that wasn't the point. Oh. It really was their doctrines. It was the doctrines. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that he opposed. Uh, Yes, he, he was, he was quite outspoken, saying that this is going to destroy our liberties because the, uh, we're replacing uh, the king with a president who has very similar powers. And in, in that sense, he was kind of correct, except that we don't elect the king, we do elect the president. And does, is there a good uh, history of that in, in some of the biographies? There's some, yeah, yeah. You can, you can look that up and in some of these we'll, we'll talk, talk about how he uh, uh, you know, was open and he published uh, his own diatribes against it. And, and he, he lost a lot of friends because of it too. Uh, one, of the, one of the really sad things about that whole episode is that Thomas Jefferson used to be his friend and they, once that happened, Thomas Jefferson, unlike George Washington, took these things very personally. And a lot of the information that in William Wirt's work is from Thomas Jefferson. And so a lot of the memories of Thomas Jefferson are part of the biography. And he skewed it against Patrick Henry hmm. a, a number of times. Not always, but he, he did skew some of it uh, hmm. against Patrick Henry. Hmm. And Jenny must have been deeply divided on the issue because George Mason also opposed right, George right. Bill Right. It was very divided. Yeah. Hmm. Anything else? All right, mm. thank you. And again, I apologize. Hopefully next week we'll, we'll get the screen working. Good job, you invited even though the pictures wouldn't work. <laughs> thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.